Uh, so next I'd like to introduce is uh, Dr. Kurt Crummel. Uh, he joined Cellula in 2006 and is currently the Associate Director of Biology. Uh, Cellula develops diagnostic assays utilizing rare cell and single cell technologies developed with cutting edge engineering, biochemistry, and cell biology expertise. Prior to joining Cellula, Dr. Crummel was a postdoc fellow at the Salk Institute in La Jolla. Uh, and with that, I'm going to bring and invite uh, Dr. Crummel onto the stage. Thank you very much. There we go. First of all, I'd just like to thank everyone uh, at LiveTech for inviting me to participate today and for enabling us to have early access to this instrument and uh, for being such gracious hosts. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about our work using the Quant Studio 12K Flex system. And we've really focused uh, in developing diagnostic assays as a company at Cellula. And to do that, we use uh, off-the-shelf technologies. We also develop some custom technologies. And we really try to push the envelope technology-wise. So we've really focused on using the system for really seeing how rare we can detect uh, particular alleles or particular loci. And what we do is we develop uh, diagnostic assays where we're interested in enumerating very rare events. So you could think of a CTC would be an example where you're trying to find rare cells in a high background. And we have a whole process that we can put against this uh, very difficult problem, beginning with whole blood where you have billions of cells, uh, enriching those cells, um, usually through some standard techniques uh, and some proprietary techniques that we use. Part of it is a cell sorting device that our, our company has. It's really clinically suitable. Um, and that can be used uh, as a disposable so uh, sample cross-contamination doesn't become an issue. Um, or we could do, uh, for example, a biopsy, uh, like a fine needle biopsy or something like that, where you also have a small number of cells. Either way, you've got a population of cells now that you've enriched for the very rare event that you're interested in. And then through some other technology that we use, we can take all of those cells, let's say thousands of cells, and really distribute those to unity, to individual reactions where we can then investigate uh, and see if there's rare alleles present or uh, particular loci present in each of those samples uh, and actually each cell from those samples. We can also use these techniques for free nucleic acids. We do some of that. Um, and then finally, on sort of downstream, then we'll take the most interesting of those reactions and then do things like array CGH or next-gen sequencing to fully analyze uh, the products. But in, in, in order to do this, um, you need to develop processes that are very good at detecting um, how optimized each step is in this process. And so we use the Quant Studio to really do that and help us count and enumerate. If we're starting with a population that we know contains, let's say, about 100 target events, at each step in the process, we might want to take an aliquot and say, how many of those did we lose? Do we still have them left? Um, are they still there to finish carrying through the whole process? So we, we use uh, enrichments from primary tissue sources and do our multi-parameter sorting, some magnetic enrichments. Um, and then we can analyze, as I said, populations up, up to about 10,000 individual cells. Um, we then apply uh, our rare allele detection chemistry, that, some that we have, some that we use uh, TACMAN chemistry, for example. Um, we also have some whole genome amplification chemistry that we can use. So if we really need to make extra copies and take aliquots, we can do that as well. And we sort of integrate all of that for um, diagnostic applications. And what we really focus on is when you have a small number of cells. So as I mentioned, maybe a, a fine needle biopsy or an enrichment process that yields um, uh, a number of cells in the sort of thousand range. Uh, and then being able to analyze each of those uh, is really where we focus. And we really want to focus on applications where you're interested not just is a mutation present, but um, which cell is it in and what else can you tell me about that cell? Does it have a particularly interesting gene expression pattern? Um, so there are chemistries out there, uh, including CASPCR, that are very good at looking for rare alleles and saying, yes, it was there. But we really want to focus on quantitation um, and as well the ability to go back to each of those reactions and learn more about what's going on with those cells. Um, and again, this is really what we do is that we take lots of reactions and look at every cell in the, in the population. So as I mentioned, we use the system, the Quant Studio system, for um, looking at parts of our process and seeing where we have um, potential optimizations that need to happen in terms of enriching cells. 
um, and finding rare events in uh, nucleic acid mixtures um, or products from cells. If we do an amplification, we want to see if there was multiple cells in that, uh, in that particular reaction and was there heterogeneity. Um, but we really like the Quant Studio because it is a, a mature system that has you know, a very streamlined workflow, consistent performance, and then the flexibility. We can do 96 well reaction, 3D4, we do lots of 3D4 well reactions. Um, and then as well, the open array platform. Uh, and then the ability to do digital is really critical for us, where we want to enumerate very accurately. Um, is there one copy? Is there five copies? Is there seven copies? Um, rather than standard qPCR, which really is pretty limited to about a two-fold difference. Um, and if you think about uh, a sample may have 1,000 copies or 500 copies, you might not be able to tell, is it really 500 or 1,000 um, if you have a two-fold uh, CT cutoff. Um, and so we run a lot of uh, standard TACMAN assays. We run a lot of SNP assays uh, for doing these sorts of rare allele detections. And I'll show you some of that work. Um, and we really push this down to taking it completely digital where we can enumerate individual genomes, uh, individual uh, loci. Uh, I think everyone should be somewhat familiar with uh, the digital aspect of qPCR, but I, I just wanted to go over this briefly, which um, digital is essentially taking a nucleic acid mixture um, and arraying it out into wells such that each well would contain either one or zero copies. Um, and then when you do your qPCR reactions, you're just looking for positives. So you're saying, how many wells lit up? If I see five wells lighting up, that means I had five copies of target in that mixture. Um, and this can be a very powerful way for enumerating accurately. Um, but the one caveat to this is that noise is critical. So if you have very few positives, you want to make sure that those positives are actually coming from um, true positives and they're not coming from some sort of an artifact or an error. So you want to make sure that when you count one, that it really was one and not a zero plus noise. Um, and, and I think as most people are familiar with, when you run a qPCR reaction, once you get out to 40 to 50 cycles, things can go wrong, things can happen. Um, uh, probes can degrade, you can have primer dimer artifacts, things like that can creep up. And if you're just doing an endpoint detection, um, sometimes those things can fool you into thinking that that was actually a positive reaction. Uh, and the answer to that is using the real-time capabilities uh, of the 12K Flex system. And here's an example. Um, and this is uh, on the right, you can see clearly an amplification plot that most of us are familiar with, a true positive. Um, but you can also see on the left that if your threshold, you'll say your CT threshold had been set somewhere around 100, you would have called that as a positive if you hadn't bothered to look at the real-time plot. But clearly, when you look at the plot on the left, everyone can see that um, that's not a normal amplification plot. There's some sort of signal that's in that well, but it's not coming from a true amplification. So in evaluating the system, we did four things. And one is um, we compared the system to um, the standard 3D4 wall to look at distribution of clusters when we're doing genotyping. We wanted to make sure that from transitioning to 3D4 to the higher throughput platform that we could still have confidence in making allele calls. Um, we also do a lot of rare allele detection. I'll show some data on that where you can look and really get very accurate estimates of sample mixtures and see is it a 10% um, purity, 1% purity, or, or even less. Uh, again, I had a little teaser there that uh, a lot of what we do is look, uh, using the real-time capabilities to detect true positives or false positives. Um, and then, obviously, when you're running lots of reactions, um, and you want to be able to do it cost-effectively, and that's another real advantage to the system. So our workflow, um, in addition to the standard sort of sample prep, getting your assay ready, adding your master mix, um, preparing a loading plate, I'll show an example of the typical way that we would do that, using the AccuField to load it, um, and then running the actual digital PCR. Then for the analysis, we've adopted a system where we'll begin with allelic discrimination, so looking at the cluster plots. But then for any of the positives that um, are not absolutely clearly clustered, we'll really zoom in and focus on those uh, with the real-time curves to confirm what's really going on in those reactions. So here's a typical loading example for us. Um, for many of the assays that we run, um, and the sort of typical TACMAN assays, um, we try to have a ratio of about 5 to 1 of background to target. And we find that when we do that, then we can uh, re retain the quantitative nature of the qPCR, and the background doesn't interfere with the true signal. Um, so in this example, we've got, let's say, a 10% target mixture that 
um, therefore has one target for every 10, uh, in this case a human DNA example, 10 total genomic equivalents, right? So if we had six nanograms or 6.7 nanograms of that sample, that would contain about 1,000 genome equivalents, um, and about 100 of those would be targets. So we know we're after 100 targets, and we've got 1,000 in their total. So this example would require about 256 wells on the open array plate. Um, each of those wells would contain less than 5 GE, about 3.9 GE. Um, and we expect, in, if this is truly a 10 percent, we'd get about one target in every two and a half wells. Um, so on one, uh, one open array plate, you actually could analyze 12 samples in this way and get a very accurate estimate of the percent target um, in every one of those. So this is an example um, showing side-by-side -side data now from the 7900 at 10 nanograms for reaction, the kind of cluster plots that we would typically see. And then on the right is an example from the 12K flex showing the exact same SNP assay, but in this case we're only using 0.03 nanograms per reaction. So huge savings in the amount of material that's required, um, and you can clearly see the cluster uh, generation uh, it shows very similar data, very comparable between the two. Um, and the amount of reagent and the amount of DNA that you need for this is obviously much, much less. We've done this a lot, and we've looked at a lot of different SNP assays, and this table is sort of summarizing all of those plots. If I were to show all those plots side by side, um, this is sort of the summary of all of that. Um, we looked at 48 different uh, assays and looked at the cluster plots, and 45 out of the 48 correlated 100% uh, between the two. Um, we did see a couple where we did get good correlation. Some of that could have been some loading issues that we had, uh, but for the most part, the, the, our experience is that if it works well in the 7900, it'll work very well in the 12K flex. We've seen very good comparative data with much less sample required. So um, I'm going to show an example where we have a digital uh, qPCR for the rare allele detection, trying to quantitate 10% uh, down to a 1%. Um, and in this particular um, example, we have a single SNP assay, and we're, again, we're doing about five genomic equivalents per reaction. Uh, we'll generally use something like a qubit fluorescent reading to get a rough idea of the amount of DNA we're starting with and then do a dilution accordingly. Um, if you were to try to run this on a 3D4, um, you could get about eight samples in a plate. Um, but using OpenRay, we can do 64 samples at a time uh, this way. So here's an example data plot. Um, and for this particular assay on the VIC channel, you can see there are three positives detected. Um, and so for this particular mixture, we went and we looked at the real-time curves. And again, we can confirm that those were real amplifications. So when we go and do the calculation on that for this particular sample, we had three out of 46 at 5 GE per well. So that's 230 total genome equivalents. Um, so 3 out of 230, it's a 1.3%. So um, in this particular example, we confirmed this is a 1% a, a um, allele sample. So another example um, where we have an issue where we wanted to confirm an undetermined call. So the software uh, in this case, uh, again, out of uh, 46 reactions and a couple of no template controls, um, determined that this was uh, undetermined. And again, going to the real-time curves, and I apologize if the color is a little bit faint, but we, when you look at both the FAM and upper and the VIC and the lower, um, you can clearly see good amplification on both channels, uh, and we could pretty readily determine that this is in, indeed a positive call. Um, and then another example where we looked, again, to determine uh, allele calls. Um, this one's a little bit more complicated in that we've got three potential positives on this one. Um, you can see one uh, sort of the far upper right, and then two clustered close to where the no template is. We wanted to confirm if those were indeed positives that perhaps just had um, less uh, amplification efficiency or if, or if those were some sort of artifact. And indeed, those two, when you looked at the real-time curves, there was nothing resembling a real-time amplification coming up in those. So clearly, we were able to determine that those uh, were artifacts um, and would have called those uh, no template or um, or certainly not positive. But in the one case of the potential real uh, amplification, uh, we could confirm that on the real-time curve that indeed it was a real amplification. And then lastly, when we look at cost and think about doing these types of assays over and over again um, for samples that we have enriched and we want to evaluate at various stages, um, it's pretty clear that from a cost perspective, um, if you tried to do this on 3D4 well plates, um, it's, there's no comparison. It's, you know, a thousand times more expensive to do it. Um, in terms of the amount of time it takes to set those plates up, uh, in terms of the amount of time it takes to run those if you were to use a single instrument, 
um, this instrument just makes a lot of sense for us to uh, run these types of assays. So we have found that the 12K flex system is really equal or superior to the standard uh, 3D4 well 7900 um, for the types of uh, assays that we run, particularly for the digital. We see excellent cluster distribution, um, superior rare allele detection. So really when you want to quantitate something very rare um, with very small amounts of sample required, um, uh, ex excellent ability to do the quality control by the fact that you can go to the real-time curves and confirm the positives or potential positives that you're seeing when every single one of those will count. Um, and then again, the cost and throughput advantages are huge. Um, so, uh, we, you know, for, for our lab, the ability to swap out blocks makes this a, a, a very easy decision for an instrument to use. Finally, I'd, I would just like to thank uh, folks in, in the lab at Cellula, uh, Yi Zhang in particular, who did a lot of the work um, uses the instrument day in, day out, um, and all of the folks at Life Tech, but in particular the folks that we interact with most of the, most of the time um, that are listed on the slide here. Uh, and thank you for your attention. <laughs>